Um, so yeah, just Woodworks, just kind of um, reiterating what we do. We're a free service. So I say we have a lot of students here. How many are students here in the room? The vast majority. Um, I don't typically help a whole lot of students out just, to, just because I'm typically busy with uh, architects and engineers. However, I have helped a number of folks with their theses and what you know the folks who were doing research and things like that. So there is an opportunity for that, but primarily we help um, designers out in the future, which you're going to all of you are going to be in the very very near future. So we're completely free. It can save you a ton of time when you get out of you know, out of college and into design and use us. Uh, how many designers do we have here? Registered designers. So just just a few. So we can more readily help you right away. Um, I routinely help architects and engineers uh, on a daily basis, particularly with mass timber. This is definitely up and coming. When I first started with Woodworks, this was about four years ago, a little over four years, about 75 to 80% of what I assisted with was light frame wood. So it was multifamily buildings, things like that, uh, smaller commercial buildings. That's now kind of flipped to where just over, I'd say, 50% are these buildings that I'm going to show you today, these mass timber buildings. So there's definitely kind of a convergence going on and in more interest in mass timber. A um, couple of housekeeping slides here. These are just mandatory AA slides, so the people who want their credit, we have to show these along with the course description. Whenever I present, I never read. Um, we'll have PDFs available to, to you so you can read all this yourself, but we'll hit all the course description, learning objectives, and all that and more. If you have questions as we go, just stop me. Um, more than happy to take questions as we go. We don't have to wait till the end. So what, what is Mass Timber? This is the agenda today. We're going to look at the appeal. Uh, the different products. There's a ton, a ton of different mass timber products that folks aren't aware of that exist. Uh, we'll look at a lot of design topics. That's primarily what I help most people with is how to design this stuff because it is relatively new um, in this area. It, years back, we used a lot of mass timber in mill buildings, things like that, you know, hundreds of years ago. Then it went away, steel dominated, and now it's definitely making a comeback. Uh, and then a ton of case studies, and then we'll look at what's next. Uh, you know, where are we going from here? So the primary appeal that I typically see for, for mass timber out of all of these is usually right here. It's the look. Um, usually the architect, the owner, they want to see this wood look. So that old wood look is definitely coming back. You know, obviously, you've walked around this building before. It's absolutely gorgeous. So that's the primary one that we see. Uh, construction speed, if you're in an urban setting, that can also be a primary driver. So in places like Boston, New York City, areas where it's really congested, um, that's where it really becomes cost competitive with steel and concrete. When you're out in uh, a less urban setting where there's less con congestion, usually it costs a little bit more. And then the urban infill, that goes along with it. The secondary drivers, now it depends on the project type. So carbon restriction reductions. On a university, this is a big deal. When you jump out to the private sector, they typically don't care about that. So depending on the project, this could jump into the primary driver um, rather easily. And then the structural performance will show some examples of how folks used mass timber as opposed to concrete basically to save cost on their foundations due to the light weight of the material. So what is mass timber? It's not a code definition. It's not in the code specifically. This is more of an industry ter term and really what it is is it's just smaller pieces. There's two different types of mass timber in this photo. Uh, it's smaller pieces put together to make up larger pieces. That's all it is, pretty simple. Up here, that's actually nail laminated timber, which we'll talk about. And then this is a glue lamb, which you have plenty of these in this building here. There's one right next to me. This is really the appeal. Um, this is why a lot of folks are doing it. They want to see this old wood look. Look up instead of seeing a concrete or a hidden drop ceiling. You get to look up and you get to actually see a beautiful structure. Wood's really the only structural material that allows for something like this. On the speed of construction, two separate projects here. Uh, one is over in England, and then the other one here, this is the Franklin Elementary School down in West Virginia. This particular one here, this was a crew that had never worked with CLT before, so they trained themselves. After they, they were out of the ground, it took them eight weeks after the, the concrete cured to put the whole structure up which is just lightning fast in terms of construction. So it comes together real quickly. So there's definitely, definitely benefits. In fact, they chose CLT for this project just because they wanted to meet the schedule of the next school year. So that's why they selected it. They were under a tight schedule. And then the lightweight performance. So I mentioned this before. So 
approximately wood's about 75% lighter than concrete. So there's a huge advantage to that. You're going to have lighter foundations. Uh, it's a safer site. You have less people putting these together, and it weighs quite a bit less, and it goes to, together real quickly as a result of it. The other bonus that we do see out of these panels, because they are so light, is when you go there and you're not using typical conventional tools, when you go to the site, it's a quiet job site. So I don't know if anyone remembers when this building was being put up, but if you walked by, it was like almost silent as you go by. You might hear someone drilling. That's about it. Um, cost of the lightweight. This is a project that was done by Len Lease, and they had never used CLT up to this point. They were on really, really poor soils. They're on this peninsula for this project, and they were trying to figure out ways to save on their foundation costs. Somebody heard about a product called cross-laminated timber. Before you know it, they designed this entire building. I think they saved about $3 million on the end just by flipping to wood as opposed to, uh, to concrete. Now, they hid most of the wood in this project, um, but this was primarily just a cost savings tool for it. And what I typically tell people is, for a product like CLT or mass timber, you really want to be out of the light framing area. So you're not going to compete with light framing in terms of cost. So what they did here is they went into the high rise. And at that point, you're competing with concrete and steel. You're not competing with light framing. And that's where it becomes more attractive economically. And then one of the, the benefits that we see um, for using wood as opposed to concrete and steel is it's the only sustainable structural material that we have. We don't have another one that's sustainable. If we do it properly, instead of letting forests die, we grab them, put them into products, put them into buildings, and it becomes almost a carbon pump. You're pulling it out, putting it into the building, storing it, and you repeat that cycle. Um, the New England Forestry Foundation's actually, uh, they've really been pushing this uh, to curb global climate change. So it's, it's really, it's, Everyone talks about how do we stop putting carbon in the atmosphere. Nobody talks about how we take it out. So this is one way we can start taking it out. Uh, on our website, if you ever want to estimate how much carbon you're storing in your building for one of these mass timber buildings, or even a light frame building for that matter, um, this is a carbon calculator. This was the Strat House building, which I showed before, the one in London. I didn't talk about it, but this, is, this was the metrics for it. And basically what we do is we take all these metrics so it shows the environmental benefit and then kind of converts it to something we can understand. You know, all of these, you know, I'm a structural engineer and I really have no idea what this means. So this, this I understand. So we convert it so uh, folks, clients, and also um, architects and engineers understand what we're doing with it. But that's a free download. And then you can see that really the only product out of all of these building materials where you have the potential to be carbon negative is wood. Uh, there's no other product where you can do it. Wood beats steel, concrete every single time. It's never even close. The thermal benefit of mass timber, this is, uh, if anyone, you all are familiar with passive house design, which is kind of net energy zero design. The Passive House folks are really excited about CLT, particularly to use it in their exterior walls uh, because it has a really tight thermal envelope. And there's also an R value that you get with wood that's a little bit higher than concrete and steel. So the Passive House folks have really picked up on this um, to use it in their exterior envelopes or their buildings. And then it's, it is disaster resilient. So there's, there's, this is a shake table over in Japan. We have one also at UCSD in San Diego. Um, they just actually, actually tested a rocking CLT shear wall. Uh, and the purpose for that is to try to get it into future codes. Um, but you can see they also tested it for debris during a tornado or a hurricane. And it performs really well. One of the only drawbacks that we have with cross-laminated timber currently, do we have any structural engineers in the room? Well, we got a few over here. It's not just you, Peggy. Um, it is the seismic R value is not published currently um, in ASCE 7. And that's something that I've been pushing for for quite some time. So for even for non-seismic applications, it's still an, an alternate means and methods design that we currently have to do. Um, I'm trying to change that. So I'll keep you posted on what happens there. And then this is relatively new. So I mentioned before that you really, with, with mass timber, you want to try to compete with concrete and steel in terms of economics. This is actually blast testing that was done for military bases um, because 
Military projects actually have to go through a blast design analysis. I've done a ton of these. So I used to do projects for the military out west. Um, and wood actually was non-existent. It wasn't even in the specs. You couldn't use wood before. Um, so this is basically an area where mass timber can compete because light framing just isn't permitted on military bases. Um, it, and all these tests went extremely well, um, performed better than expected. And as a result, now there's two hotels that are, are one's finished, the other's under construction on military bases, the first two in the United States. Uh, Lend Lease is doing both of those currently. But this just shows you how blast resistant it is. And then the flexibility of using something like, like wood, this particular one here, we had never, at least when I was designing, we could never pull something like this off. Flat plates that are wood. Um, we've been asked by clients to do that in the past. CLT wasn't available at the time. We just have to tell them couldn't do it. This is something that we can currently do. So this is almost like a concrete two-way slab, except it's wood. Uh, this was a project in Chicago. Um, it won a number of awards out there. It was a, a little kiosk uh, shade structure. It's right on one of the Great, the great Lakes. Great Lakes. So looking at the different systems that we have, so when we say horizontal systems, what we really mean are um, floors, plates, uh, roofs, things like that. And these are all the products that are typically available currently that are mass timber members. Vertical systems, we're talking about posts, walls, things like that. And primarily for those systems, you're looking at cross laminated timber or a post and beam system like this one is here. Well, I'll touch on each of these these um, products that are available in a second here. There's also different ways to lay buildings out, different ways to design them. Um, the post and beam one seems to be one of the most popular ways to do it. That's what this building is here. So basically you're coming in with glue lambs, um, glue, glue lamb beams, posts. They could be steel for that matter. If you have longer spans, it can be a hybrid system. We have seen to save on costs, folks use light framed wood walls that are bearing and then you're covering those up anyways. And then just where you're exposing the wood on the plates, you would expose products like cross-laminated timber or nail-laminated timber. It's kind of a cost savings uh, effort there. And then the full mass timber building, um, the Forte building that I showed um, a few slides back, that was a full mass timber building. So there's different ways to do it. This one is the most popular. Different products that are available. Nail-laminated timber, this has actually been in the code forever. It's all it is is two buys slapped together. You're just screwing or nailing them together. That's it. There's another firm up in Structure Craft. It's up in Canada. They're actually starting to do these with wood dowels. And the reason they're doing that is because they can actually just put it in a machine and it just basically runs right through the machine. So they don't have to have people actually using a nail gun for that. Cross laminated timber. Primarily what I'm talking about today will be CLT coming up. Um, but CLT is pretty straightforward. Layers of, of um, of wood glued together, oriented perpendicular to each other, and there'll be a good graphic of that. On smaller applications, we also have seen people just take glue lambs and tip them on their side as decking. Um, I've seen that done for walkways, uh, just little spot areas for projects. Um, tongue and groove decking, I've done a ton of projects with TNG decking, um, all, churches, um, trying to think of the other ones that we used to do uh, for the parks out in California. They used to like wood for the environmental side of it, so we used to do a lot of TNG decking. That was before CLT was available. It's kind of showing my age here now. <clears throat> and then timber composites. I'm sure most of you know about that. This is the, Peggy, the largest timber composite in the United States. It's definitely the U.S. Is it North America? <laughs> and then using other products like LVLs, things like that. that this is a little bit less. Um, it's used less than the other products. So the, the two big ones that we're seeing for floors and roofs anyways are NLT and CLT currently. Those are kind of the big, the big systems that are, are being used. There we go. So this is just a shot of a glue lamp. Pretty straightforward. It's just layered with uh, two buys in this case, and then they're glued together. Usually the lower level layers are actually higher grade, and that's the reason for that is the higher grade costs more. It's a better way to use the wood, so it's almost like a steel uh, W section where the bottom flange is taking out the, the tension, 
Same, same idea here. Your, your stronger layers down below are taking out uh, more of the load. If you're going to cantilever a beam, then you also want the stronger layers up above. So it's just a different way to spec it. But that's a glue limb. These glue limbs are a little bit different. Um, it's even smaller layers that are next to each other. Primarily, this, these are how glue limbs are done uh, in the United States and Canada. And these things can span pretty far. This is the Olympic Oval. Um, this was up when Canada had the Olympics. So this was their, you know, whenever there's Olympics, there's always a signature building. This was their signature one. And they really wanted to, because they use a lot of wood up there, it's one of their, it's basically their, their, natural, their biggest natural resource. So they wanted to use wood for the project. And so they really wanted to highlight what you could do with it. And these glue lands, it's actually two glue lands, and they use steel to take out a little bit of the tension. They're spanning 330 feet out to out, so all the way across that. That's a speed skating rink. Some great, if you ever Google this building, there's some great shots of it when the, the speed skaters are flying around there. Nail laminated timber. So this is one of the, I want to point out the, one of the main differences between nail laminated timber and cross laminated timber. You'll notice this gap here. That gap is there for thermal expansion and contraction. When wood, particularly when it's under construction, takes on moisture, it swells. <clears throat> cross laminated timber actually won't swell because it's cross laminated and the layers hold it together. NLT does not have that ability. So what we do is you want to, you can design it and calc it. How much is it actually going to swell? And that's what this gap is here for. So it's approximately every eight to 10 feet you want to leave out a board. Uh, after the building's closed up, you can go back in there and fill that. Uh, some people just leave it there. Um, but that's, de that's definitely something you want to take, uh, take into account. There's a couple projects that I assisted with. Um, one's in New York City. They forgot to do this, caused huge problems. The building basically went out of plumb. So that's, you can't, you definitely cannot miss that. And then they wanted a solution after the fact. Not very easy to do. <clears throat> This is just where it's in the code. So I did mention it's been in the code forever. It's actually called mechanically, I'm trying to find it. It's called mechanically laminated timber in the code. Um, the industry term is nail laminated timber, but the actual code is, is, is different. And there's a shot of it. Under, this is the T3 building in Minneapolis. It's a six story office building. And this is what I mentioned, every eight to 10 feet or so, you wanna make sure you allow those panels to breathe, expand, contract as they take in and let, let go of moisture. So wood, unlike other materials, it doesn't expand when temperature changes. It's moisture that you have to watch out for with wood. And then the bullet center. So this, this again, I, I did mention some of the primary drivers. The primary driver for this building was the carbon reduction, um, and they wanted to meet the living building challenge. Uh, my colleague out on, in the Pacific Northwest, this building's in Seattle, um, they called him because they were having a tough time doing it. And they said, hey, we heard using wood might help. And so before you know it, he ran into their office, gave them all the data. They flipped this building from steel to wood. And then at that point, it totally flipped all of their calculations. They were far more easily able to meet the living building challenge, which is basically like lead on steroids. Let's see if we have a shot of the interior. In fact, they used to have solar panels. Initial renditions kind of running down the face of it. They were able to pull all those off just by looking at the carbon sequestration. And there's a shot of it. And this is, again, the look that we're seeing just so much interest in, uh, particularly for office spaces, schools, um, those types of occupancies. Post and beam, and then you have that beautiful wood look to it. And there's a shot of it after it's done. This one's on kind of a small grid. I think that's only about 12 feet apart. So this was a really ideal for wood. It worked out really well for the project. And all of the wood you'll see here, it has kind of a darker look to it, uh, as opposed to what we're seeing here, which is a lighter look. This is all, this is because this project's out west, so this is all dug fur. What am I looking over here? These? Oh, those are just, those are just screwed right up. Shooting over here. Yeah, for these, um, for a lot of these buildings, and it's similar to this one, a lot of these elements are exposed in the end. Um, now, they don't have to be. We'll, we'll get into construction types in a little bit here. And then a lot of folks think that just because you're using wood, you can't get a high-end uh, office. This was a Class A office space, and that was the, the goal, one of the other goals of the project. 
So it worked out really well for it. There's a case study on this of this building on our website if you want to learn more about it. Um, another thing which I won't get into that they did for this project is the the way they looked at their connections from post to post um, and from beam to beam was interesting in terms of a, a fire rating um, requirement. If we have a shot of it later on, I think I'll, I'll talk about that. And then taping, t taking glue lambs and just tipping them on their side. Again, this isn't too, too common. Uh, it's, this is a larger project here, but um, for the most part, this is done usually just on a smaller basis. So you're just basically tipping them over, using them as decking. So similar to nail laminated timber, you do have to gap them. So you're going to have a lot of gaps with these glue lambs, and that is to take care of that, that expansion contraction with moisture. So you can kind of see it here as well. And then tongue and groove decking. Um, one of the things that we, we used to do this frequently is we used to almost always put a layer of plywood up above. So there's your TNG decking. That plywood basically takes uh, your diaphragm allowable shear values and it really jacks it up to something similar to steel. Um, it, it really, at that point, it becomes a block diaphragm and it really increases your allowable loads. Now, most of our projects were out west, so we couldn't justify the, the decking to work anyways because the, the seismic loads were too high. Um, but we just got so used to it that we, we would just slap it on there anyways, even if it was only a 3 8 inch uh, layer to do that. It just ties everything together nicely. Plus, it's a nice working surface as opposed to you know, beating up on the wood. Same thing, this is just a higher grade. So there are different grade uh, wood that you can specify for all of these. Uh, the radiator building, this is another one out in Portland. Um, so what we do see, a lot of these projects we're showing are out in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, the good news is, is that we are seeing that the area that has the second most interest in the country is our area, the Northeast. So we're kind of next in line for a lot of these buildings to start coming down the pipe, pipeline here. Uh, but this is a TNG decking. You can see it has a nice clean look to it. And then glue lambs, and then they went with the post and beam system. So office spaces are really, really popular. And then this is the, uh, the developer and uh, just touting the, the whole sustainability side of it as well. The other thing that happens with these buildings, particularly for office space, but the few residential that we have seen, is they're able to rent these out for, for more than what you would where wood's not exposed. So you get like seven or eight bucks more square foot when you rent them out in the end. And then cross laminated timber, this is definitely the, the most exciting one that's, that's kind of coming here. Uh, it's, I'm seeing a ton of interest in CLT. It's, it's, it's pretty impressive, but you can see from the photo, it's just layers of two bys and they're laid down, put oriented perpendicular to each other and they're just glued and pressed down and that, that's all it is. Um, and the, I, I did mention the benefit of, of CLT over NLT is that you don't have to gap it. It's not going to expand and contract during construction. So that is one of the major benefits of it. The different sizes, the different manufacturers have different sizes. When I assist people on CLT projects, I usually tell them, because in your specs, you want to be able to leave it open to a number of different firms or different manufacturers. Now they can go as, as much as 64 feet, but every manufacturer in the North America can make a panel that's eight foot by 40 foot. So if you spec that, you won't be pulling um, manufacturers off the table. You can always change that later, uh, but that's typically what I tell people, eight by 40. There we go. And there's just a nice shot of it. So the cross section of it, you can see the, the layers here. These layers here aren't glued. It's the only, only the flat layers that are glued. The different layups, so you can go from a three ply all the way up to a nine ply. I think there are some nine plies uh, in this building. The most common size that we see for floors and roofs in the Northeast is the five ply. Five ply is kind of the sweet spot. If you can lay your building out where the spans work for a five ply, it's going to be pretty economical. Uh, when, when you start jumping into the seven and nine, it becomes a little bit less economical when you're comparing it to steel. It's just more material. Um, then the other thing that a lot of folks don't think about is more material means more trucks. So less panels fit on the truck. I wondered why CLT wood doesn't expand. Like it doesn't expand the loads. Like how you said in the other design, yep. you have to do the Why not with this one? Good, good question. So. If you think about how a tree, when it's living, when it takes on water, it swells. And when it releases it, it'll shrink. 
only in those two directions. So in each axis against the tree. The length of the tree doesn't increase or decrease. And so when you cross laminate it, this layer is glued. And so as, as this layer tries to swell, this layer is grabbing it and it's not allowing it to because along the length of the member, it's holding it all together. Does that make sense? <clears throat> That's the first time I've ever done a tree analogy. <laughs> Uh, this is one of the projects that I mentioned. This one's actually now complete. It's the Candlewood Suites, uh, first mass timber building on a military base um, down in, I think this is in Alabama. Um, the this disappointing thing about this project is they covered all the wood up. So they, they wanted the Candlewood Suites to look exactly like every other Candlewood Suites they have everywhere in the rest of the country. So when you go in here, you have no idea that's a wood building, but it is a wood building. That this was them putting on one of their panels. Uh, one of the items that the developer likes to tout is that when he puts the panels down, he typically has the rails already on there, so he thinks that's a nice time saving. So he just drops it right into place. So the OSHA requirements. Um, jumping into the code stuff. So 2015 IBC, this is the first time we've had CLT in our building code. Um, it's 100% in there for all the architectural items. Um, you're good to go. And we'll talk about construction types in a little bit. The only area it's not, as I mentioned, is that R value for seismic. Um, now, a lot of engineers don't want to do something that's not in the code. I think they're overreacting. Um, I, I do have a heavy seismic background. Um, but for me, I would probably just do a conservative R, two, three, something like that. Um, wind's probably going to govern either way and then be done with it. Uh, but a lot of engineers, I'm trying to convince them that, you know, this really isn't that big of a deal. Uh, but I'm trying to get that in there for you all. Okay, okay, I will. Can I do another tree analogy? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so the, the seismic R is, it's a, it's a ductility factor. And so the building code and the structural sections assign an R value. The higher the R value, the more ductile the element is. So like a steel, a special steel moment frame, for example, which is really, really flexible. And ductile has a very high R because it, moves back and forth in a seismic event, and it dissipates energy. The more stiff something is, like a concrete wall that's not reinforced, has a, a lower R value, if that makes sense, because it doesn't allow it to dissipate energy as it goes back and forth. So that's, that's the R value that we're trying to get in the code for seismic. So I hope, hope I didn't confuse everyone with the two R's, the architectural and the, the structural R values. Um, Spans. This is a span table from Structure Lamb, which is on the West Coast. Um, and the manufacturers, I should mention, that we do have. Um, Structure Lamb's on the West Coast. DR Johnson. Uh, Smart Lamb's on the West Coast, although they're going to open up a plant in Maine within the next you know, year or two, year and a half, is what I've been told. International Beams now down in Alabama. They're about to get certified. And uh, for North America, I think that's it. What's it? Oh, Nor Nordic. <laughs> right, the closest one to us. <laughs> And then Nordic's up in, in, uh, in Canada, just north of us, north of Montreal. I almost missed them. <clears throat> uh, oh, for the spans. What I typically tell folks for your spans is if you're going to go with a five-ply, this is a, a one-way. So this is taking a, a panel from one beam to the next. You can actually span it over multiple beams. And when you do that, it becomes, um, it can span further structurally. Uh, it just changes the, the distribution of the loads. And so 16 feet is kind of, kind of like the sweet spot. You can go a little bit further, but when you're laying grids out, just plan on a 16-foot uh, span if you're going to do a five-ply. Now, if you have smaller spans, you know, a three-ply is going to save you more money. Larger, more grand spans, like um, in the atrium out here or the hallway, you may have a, a, a seven or a nine-ply. CLT handbook, this is no longer in hard print, unfortunately, and this is an older slide. It's saying rethink wood. Um, it's a free download on thinkwood.com's website. So if you want to download that, jump on their website, with the caveat that it's about that thick. So it's, it's not a, a user-friendly download. They're supposed to be using, doing a new U.S. handbook uh, within the next year or so, and I think that's why they stopped, um, they stopped developing these or printing these, these, um, these manuals. Uh, it is good if you're interested in a, a single topic. So let's say you want to learn about fire. Well, you can download that whole chapter and read that one at a time, but it is... Downloading the whole thing, it is a lot. 
Am I frozen here? Let's see if I can advance it this way. Oh, the battery's running low on the computer. I think that's all it was. So this is the, the design building here under construction. Uh, one of the things I actually I love about this building uh, as a structural engineer is it used so many different materials. So you've got, this is a steel beam that you're seeing. That's the top flange of a steel beam. And then you've got your wood. And this is a composite design. So the concrete's going to come in here and engage those studs to allow this beam to span further. Similarly, and I'm sure Peggy's chatted with a lot of you about it, that's what you're doing here with the, the wood connection here. They're epoxied in, engaging the concrete. It really stiffens up the floor. It gets you longer spans. Uh, really assists with vibration as well. So it's a, definitely an innovative technology. And there it is under construction. See this, this is um, just some added, uh, mo for the most part, that's used for sound mitigation. Um, because one of the challenges, and we're trying to get some testing done on it with wood, is because acoustics is a function of how heavy something is, the mass. So the benefit that we saw earlier of, of timber, because it's lighter, is actually a drawback in acoustics. So you have to do something typically an acoustic mat. In this case, it looks like it's a little bit thicker. And then they poured the concrete over and engaged the, uh, the HBV plates that you're seeing there, the light gauge plates. This isn't all that popular. Um, I've designed both of these on many projects. Usually, these are products that are hidden. So it'd be something supporting a beam within a wall, um, that type of thing. But people are using them as uh, mass timber plates, primarily in Europe. You can see it does have that. This is an, an, uh, an LVL. It's just little, little thin veneers glued together, so you have kind of that razor look to it. CLT is definitely more, more popular, and there's just a shot of the, uh, the LVL um, floor and then also wall system that they have there. So jumping into the design topics, I know most of you all are, are students, but this will be kind of a nice... Um, Nice background on how, how do we classify buildings. You know, where does mass timber currently fit? Um, primarily, mass timber is in types 4, 3, 4, and 5. Types 1 and 2 are, not, are typically non-combustible construction types, although there are some areas where you can use wood in both of those construction types. I think I'll show a slide of that in a little bit here. So heavy timber, that's what this building is actually classified as. This is a type 4 building. And all heavy timber is, is a minimum wood thickness. So you, if you design a building and just go back and double check the minimum thicknesses that the code requires, you're done. You don't have to worry about fire ratings. It's the code recognizes that a minimum thickness is going to give you approximately a fire rating. And so that's, that's one of the benefits of type 4 construction. Type 5, that's where most of our wood pro, um, projects are, type 5. So single family homes. Smaller multi-family homes, those are typically type 5. And then when you jump into type 3, 3 and 4 are, are relatively similar. Um, the definition of 3 and 4 is exterior walls are non-combustible. Um, this building has non-combustible exterior walls. They're, they're metal studs. Uh, in the interior for type 3, you have to meet a certain fire rating, depending on how you classify it. Type 4, you don't need to. It's The code's recognizing a minimum thickness of wood is going to give you a certain fire rating. There are benefits to both of these, which I'll jump into in a second. Oh, yeah. I, I, I glossed over that. Yes. there's So all the multifamily buildings that you see, the, the greater Boston area, that are five stories or sometimes more, sometimes as a podium, the exterior walls are almost always fire retardant treated wood. So they, they, they could have done that for this building. Um, I suspect it had more to do with the facade detailing from the company who did the facade than anything else, where their detail probably just showed a metal stud. It, yeah, it's basically it's a product. I forget the name of it, but it, it prevents flame spread. That's all it's meant to do. So type both type that can be done in type four and type three, and that's only for the exterior walls. One of the drawbacks of type four. This is actually the biggest drawback by far is you're technically not supposed to have any concealed spaces. Now, this building is type 4, and this does have concealed spaces. 
um, the design team got a variance. And so what they did is they do have some areas with, with drop ceilings, but they came in, they did an alternate means and methods, got a variance in, in all these concealed spaces in this building, they have sprinklers. So they turn the sprinkler heads in there, which is, which is fair. <clears throat> there are other, there are, there are other alternatives. So I, this particular building also could have been classified as type 3A. And the difference would have been, they wouldn't have to get this variance, but you would have to calculate the fire resistance of the wood. So instead of just saying, I've got a minimum thickness, I'm done, the code doesn't let you do that in type 3. You have to calculate the fire resistance in type 3. And so this is the different fire ratings that we have. So types 3A, your roof, con oh, oh wait, this is, I'm sorry, back up here. This is actually a caveat in the code. If you ever work on a project where you just want the roof to be mass timber, footnote C in this table, 601, which is where we go for our fire ratings, footnote C allows types 1B, which is a non-combustible uh, non construction type, and everything in types 2, and also 3, 4, 5. It allows you to just use heavy timber, a minimum thickness for your roofs. So that's just another area where you can do it. Um, I think I'll show a project of that here in a second here. This, yep, this is uh, the jet port up in Portland. And so this is a type 1B building. So that's non-combustible uh, elements basically everywhere in the building, except you can see the timber there from the roof. It's a gorgeous building. In fact, I went in there, um, <laughs> I went in there, I did a lunch seminar uh, across the street, and I was like, well, I'm just going to take the, take the shuttle over there. And when I went, I went in, I started taking photos of the, of the building. Within about two seconds, TSA came over and started grabbing me. What are you doing? They, th they thought I was trying to take the building down or something. But Mark, yeah. could you address how the connectors in mass timber were addressed with the fire codes? Yep. I, th I think we have slides on that coming up. Okay. If not, we can, we can circle back to that. I I'm pretty sure that, that there's definitely slides coming up. There's a shot of it from the interior. It's so all steel, and then this is all just mass timber. So you have large glue lambs. Now this was um, this was tongue and groove decking. So at the time, the structural engineer for this is uh, Jim DeStefano from DeStefano and Chamberlain. He's down in Connecticut. At the time, cross laminated timber wasn't available. Uh, he basically said if CLT was available, they would have absolutely used it. It would have saved a ton of money and time because the tongue and groove decking you have to put in piece by piece as opposed to large panels that you just drop down in place. But that's just a, a caveat in the code that you can take advantage of if you just want to do roofs. Um, looking at building size, oh, jump back one. Um, this is for an office occupancy. So type four, types three, and types two, non-combustible, are combustible construction types. You can see you can get identical number of stories, identical height, and comparable um, allowable area. So this is the total area here. Depending on the occupancy, it's either identical for, for timber or slightly less. So fire resistance, this is probably architecturally, other than construction types, your most important thing when you do a job is to actually pick the right construction type for your, your building, for the architects. This is the number two thing that I assist architects and engineers with. Wood is actually, it's very different than a steel or a concrete design in that the structural engineer actually calculates the fire resistance of exposed timber. That's not the case for any other structural material. The architect handles the fire ratings everywhere else, but the structural engineer is going to have to do some calculations um, if you're going to if you're going to need to calculate the resistance of wood. And just something I like to show: just you know, people say, "Hey, wood burns." Yeah, it does burn, but actually, mass timber doesn't light up; it chars, and that's what you're seeing here. This is a glue lamb, and that's a steel beam. Same exact fire test loaded identically. When the steel beam failed, the wood in this case still had 75% of its structural capacity, and that's because wood chars. It doesn't just light up and start burning away. A big, large piece of timber chars, protects itself, and we know very predictably, we can, we can predict it and calc it, how slow that happens or how fast it happens. And it's pretty simple. There's char layer. It's about one and a half inches per hour is approximately what happens with mass timber. And you just want to make sure you have a structural section that can 
basically take the load over whatever time you're trying to design it for. So whether it's one hour or two hours. Our partner organization, AWC, they actually have a good document, TR10 on the website, free download, and it goes through design examples of how to calculate this. It's actually relatively simple. Uh, for, as a structural engineer, this is one of the easiest calculations in, in the code. We talked a little bit about acoustics. Uh, there's two items you want to take care of with acoustics, STC and then ICC. This one is the big problem with mass timber. Um, typically, for other wood projects that are light frame, you're going to cover it up. You can have some assembly down here that can handle it. Now, with mass timber, we typically want to expose it, so we don't have the ability to go underneath it unless you want to completely hide it like that candlewood suites that we saw. Uh, so these are, these are the two that we want to take care of. And what we typically do, there's a number of different firms now that have different acoustic mats, um, and they actually have interactive tools on, on their website now. This is something from Maxon. I forget the name of the other one I just bumped into. Um, but they can basically spit out the ICC and the STCs for you. And then if you have an acoustic mat, some type of topping, and then whatever flooring you have, it'll basically give you your STC rating. And you can get above you know, the minimum that's required in the code um, or go beyond it if you want. This is usually an inch and a half of gypcrete or concrete is usually what it is. Um, now, if you do a composite system like this building, it's going to have to be a structural section. So, but it, it's inch and a half minimum is what is what's going to get you the, the the fire, not the fire, the acoustical rating. And you're going to have that with steel as well. So, steel metal deck's going to have even even more concrete. And that's typically what folks do around here: steel. Steel with metal deck. This is just a shot of an acoustic mat. So mass timber shaft walls. Um, when I first moved back from the West Coast, this was like four and a half years ago, started with woodworks. This was something that I naively was trying to help people to do with wood shaft walls. We did all of our shaft walls in the West Coast out of wood. It's just that's what we did because you're not mixing your structural systems. Gets into that structural R system that I was talking about. If you mix those, it's, it's a tougher design. Um, I quickly realized that nobody does shaft walls out here out of wood. Um, within the last year or two, folks are. Uh, this is actually a shot, I think, of this project, the UMass building. Um, since this one has done shafts, there's two others that I'm aware of now that have done these mass timber shafts. And people are catching on and starting to do it out of light framing. So I tried a little bit too early. It took a few more years, and people are catching on to it. Um, a lot of folks don't think you can do shaft walls out of wood. They don't think the code permits it. It's completely wrong. It's definitely... Uh, not a material that's not accepted. It depends on, on your construction type. So if you're in a wood construction type, you're fine. So there it is under construction, the shaft walls. And one of the benefits of using doing your shaft walls out of wood is the time savings that you have. Uh, so the last project that I assisted with, it's a four-story multifamily building. It's all light-framed, except for their shaft walls. They didn't want to use masonry. Uh, they just wanted to get the shafts up, so they put up a four-story shaft in, I think they said, three and a half hours. And that's a crew that had never done it before. This would, if this were masonry, it would take weeks. You have to wait for everything to be poured, put the rebar in, and work your way up slowly. <clears throat> and then looking at the, a lot of folks ask me what the what's an envelope for these types of buildings. It's usually no different than a steel or a concrete building. You're putting something on the exterior, you're protecting it. You're usually not exposing any of the wood on the exterior. It's just this stuff's not meant to be, or CLT is not meant to be on the exterior, except if you, I have seen it on overhangs. That's the only spot where it's not getting the direct, um, the, the elements directly hitting it. So snow, rain, that type of thing. And then jumping into the lateral design, there's different ways to do the lateral design of these, of these projects. And everyone does it a little bit different. This particular one here, this is the T3 building in Minneapolis. This is nail laminated timber, post and beam glue lamb. They're dragging all of their wind and seismic lateral loads into this central concrete core. So they decided that we're going to use something laterally that's 100% in the building code, and that's why they did it. They didn't want to deal with an alternate structural design for this particular project. <laughs> now, for me, I probably would have put brace frames out here, but that's just me. This is a shot of this project. Um, 
So this, this particular project actually used lateral um, CLT shear walls. So the cores are actually taking seismic and wind load in, in a wind and seismic event. Um, this is one of the hold downs. So from panel to panel, and this is a shear connector. So taking the load from one panel and dumping it down to the load below. Other options that we, we see that are viable options, this is again, if you wanna stay 100% in the current code, this is a special steel moment frame, which is in the structural code for that R value that I talked about structurally. So they only use these frames where they wanted to put their resisting elements, and then they use timber everywhere else. Light frame shear walls, this is also in the building code. So you can mix that system with, with CLT as well or other, other mass timber. And usually these walls are covered up anyways. So this is actually a pretty economical way to, to do a, a system. This will be, they'll throw some jip board or some type of covering over it. And then you look up and that's where you're seeing the timber. This is another shot of this building here. And this jumps into the connection um, question that you, you were asking about a few minutes ago here. Um, as we saw in the slide with the steel beam that was all warped and failed, you know, timber is actually gonna perform better in a fire. So what we do as engineers, architects, is you detail it so that you're providing enough cover of, of, the, of the wood. So the wood's providing you a minimum amount of cover and giving you that fire rating. And that's what's, that's what's going on here. So within this detail, there's steel, but the wood's providing you that fire rating. So if it's an, it's an hour, you need about an inch and a half of cover all around the steel to, to uh, protect it. Uh, they do have other types of connectors. I think this is by MightyCon, um, where they go in there and you screw this in. And you can see they're just sliding that into place. You come around and you firecock that. They just tested that connection a couple months ago, two, three months ago. And they were hoping to get an hour fire rating for it. They got two hours. So you can get a pretty high fire rating for something like that. So this is a similar, this is a, is this the UMass project? This is either UMass or it's the Bullet Center. They, very similar connections for both projects. There's a few things I like about this, this connection. You're, so for fire, you're coming in and this is the element that you're protecting. You're, you're protecting it with all of the wood. So you're giving it enough cover. So for fire, you're covered. Within an hour, it's gonna have to go through all that wood before it gets to the steel. And by that point, you're, everyone's out of the building. The other thing that I like about this detail is we talked about um, expansion contraction earlier. It looks like she left. Um, <clears throat> this detail really helps with shrinkage. So wood doesn't shrink and expand along the length. It only does along the depth and the width. This basically eliminates all shrinkage throughout that detail. So it's a really clever detail. The Bullet Center used this, UMass used similar connections, and the Bullet Center saved, I forget how much, but it was quite a bit by this type of connection, as opposed to other options like using intumescent paint on the steel, which is, is far less economical. And there's just a shot of them dropping a column down. Um, you can see very similar steel construction. That's one of the things I like about the slide. Oftentimes people say, who's building this stuff? It is a mix. Sometimes it's the wood folks, sometimes it's the steel folks. But it's very similar. You're taking a beam or a post, dropping it in, screwing it off. Very, very simple. And then you're simply screwing right down. So that's why these panels do go up so quickly. So looking at some projects, this is the Tamedia building, uh, one of the more popular uh, wood types of projects. This I'd like to show this one because this look here is something that I see from architects all the time. They this whole glazing exterior, looking in and seeing the timber. There's, oh gosh, probably 10 projects that I'm assisting with. I'm just waiting for one to go forward. Um, like this, one's in New York City, it's huge. Uh, a couple in Boston, um, Portland. But this, this whole look is definitely, it's popular. And then on the interior, it's all, it's all mass timber. You can say they actually pegged it together here. So this was you know, pretty impressive stuff. Not your everyday type of a wood project. And then churches, uh, I mentioned, I think earlier, I did a lot of churches. One of the things I used to love about doing church designs um, is one of the rare building occupancies where after I was done, I could go in and see my structure. Every other one, generally, they'd cover it up. But it has, it has a good look for that as well. And then aquatic centers. So this is another popular occupancy where a lot of folks think wood is a bad selection. It's actually your best one. Because as I did mention before, it takes on moisture and releases it. 
one of the issues with these types of, set of uh, aquatic centers is it's really if you're using steel, it's going to rust. And concrete spalls a lot. And once it spalls, it exposes rebar, and then you have problems. It's tough to fix it once that occurs. So a lot of the aquatic centers and like the Great Wolf Lodge, for example, they're selecting wood for their material due to that reason. So they figured it out. Um, Aspen Art Museum, this is, if you ever have a chance, just Google this project. It's pretty impressive. Um, there's a, the engineer presents for us every once in a while on this project, and every time I get an opportunity to see it, I see it. This was, this project here is nowhere near in any building code that exists. They basically, they tested this stuff. It, it's, it's amazing. So anyways, long story short, if you have a chance to check that one out, check it out. We'll probably have a webinar on, on that one at some point in the near future here. And then Albany Yard, so another you know, little four-story, small building. A few in Boston that are, are going to be about this size. It's definitely coming. And you can see they, again, one with the light frame shear walls, so just to save on some economics. And then our design building here. This is when it was, wasn't quite complete. Alex took the photo. You get credit. And we all know about this building. Really, really impressive building. Um, <coughs> One of the things I like to tell about, about this building, a lot of the universities now, Harvard, MIT, you know, these big wig universities, they, they approach me and they're like, hey, I'm, we're thinking of doing a mass timber building. And I'm always like, okay, well, what do you need help with? And, and then usually after the conversation is done, I said, I'll say something like, you know, that state school out west already has one of these. And, and they're always like, what? It's like, yeah, it's two hours to the west. Just drive out there and check it out. So they have no idea. But all, all the universities now, so UMass, we're the first one on the map in the Northeast here to do it. Um, but all the other ones are now like racing to get the next one done. So congrats to UMass on this one. And I didn't mention I am a UMass alum here. I went to school here years back. <clears throat> so there's a shot of it. And then the T3 building, we already saw a few photos of that, so I'll kind of just fly through. Uh, the CLT was actually on the table for this project. They went with NLT uh, just to the location of the project. Uh, the company who ships the panels, they were relatively close to compared to the, the closest CLT plant, so they were able to save some money. They're going to replicate this building in a number of di different areas in the country now, and I think the next one, I'm trying to remember where it is. There's another one. Is it is it Jersey? There's, a, there's another one then. I'm, I don't even know about that one. Um, but I think the next one's going to be CLT, so they're flipping it to CLT. There's a shot of it under construction. So where are we going from here? There's actually a conference right now with inspectors and our, our partner organization. I saw him at some point, Matt Hunter. He's actually trying to get these folks to vote. Um, any ICC voters in here? Probably not. I don't think so. No. Um, Tallwood's something that's coming in the building code. One of the things I like to point out, though, is it's not new. Uh, I visited this building about six months ago. Uh, this building has been around you know, since, I think, the late 1800s. And it's a nine-story building, absolutely gorgeous, uh, kind of has that old mill building look to it. This is the Carbon 12 building. This particular one, um, this did an alternate means and methods design. Um, my colleague out, I mentioned him before, Ethan, um, he actually helped significantly with this project. Um, but they, have, they went full CLT. This is, I think, the first, the first modern mass timber building that's uh, a high-rise uh, in the United States. This particular building, unfortunately, went on hold. Now, I don't think it's dead. It's just projects go on hold and off hold all the time, uh, and it's always random. But this one actually won the wood design competi competition along with a project in New York City that's not going forward. Um, but this is a 12-story one, really impressive. Um, CLT they exposed a bunch of it, post and beam, blue lands. This is actually a CLT rocking wall. and. Most of you probably aren't aware what that is. It's kind of a newer technology. CLT panels all the way up, and then they post tension rods in the middle. And then basically, in a seismic event, it rocks back and forth and comes back to plumb. That's just the ins and out of how it works. And that's the testing that they did at the, the um, University of UCSD down in San Diego as well, the rock and wall tests. Um, so there's a vote that's going to be coming up later this month. And... It's looking good for, for tall wood. So right now we're stuck at either five or six stories depending on the occupancy and the building code's behind. The building code was intended for light framing. A mass timbers, it's a complete different category of its own. Uh, but the change is actually gonna be, change is slow. 
to the 2021, and that boat's coming up. Uh, and that's part of the reason why Matt Hunter's here. He's given a tour of this building a little bit later on, uh, is to hopefully convince some of the, uh, the ICC voters to vote for it. And it, it's looking positive. The general idea is this is some of the fire tests that were done um, to um, go through the changes. But the general idea is you can go up to 18 stories, but you have to fully cover everything with gypboard, uh, one or two layers. I forget if it was one or two. Um, up to nine stories, you can fully expose the wood. So every, anywhere you want to expose it, you can expose it. And then up to, I believe, 12 stories, you can expose 30% of the wood. Uh, so th th that's basically the different tiers that they have. There's a number, of, another, uh, a number of different other changes, but that's kind of the big changes. So what they did with all these tests that perform really well is they simulated um, a sprinkler failure. So it stopped. They basically wouldn't turn it on for like another 15 minutes after the fire. Um, they had wood 100% exposed in one test. They had a gyp board 100% in the other. They had the 30% on another test, and it, it performed really, really well. So it, it basically all of these tests far exceeded what most people were expecting to occur. The gyp the gyp board test, yeah, and that's the yeah. I have so I have seen that. Um, yeah, and it's you know structurally it's not a problem. We we can calc it out. That's that's the easy part. What everyone freaks out about is fire. So when you get up that that tall, that particular building was actually a hybrid. So it had concrete. I believe it had concrete in it as well. Perimeter beams and they connect the panels to it. Um, but you know structurally it can definitely be done and it can perform well in a fire. It's just a matter of that would be that would still be an alternate means and methods. So so we're capping off at 18 currently. Now everyone gets so excited about these tall wood projects. In reality. You're looking at less than one percent of, of mass timber projects in the future, um, but still, we we do need to get something in the code, in my opinion, because it's it is an area that's lacking. Um, these tests they they perform so well. I think what I was what I was going to mention is the test with the gyp board when it was covered. They went in after it self extinguished, so it didn't even need the sprinklers to do it. When they pulled the gyp board off, the wood was pristine, so it wasn't even affected. So it's it performed really really well. So that would give you some hope for that 40-foot tower. <laughs> this is one of the tests that, that was done for the uh, Carbon 12 building um, out west here. And this was a two-hour fire test on a glue lamp. Um, I'm not sure why they did that fire test. We already knew it would do that. Um, but they did it anyways. Brock Commons. So this is an 18-story building. That's a concrete level. 18 stories of mass timber up above. Now, for this project, they covered all of the wood up. So two layers of gyp board. I think they might even use three. It was just an olive branch to the, the, the code officials up there. Uh, they just loaded it up with gyp board. But this is a student dormitory uh, up, in, up in Vancouver. <laughs> really impressive building. Laterally, they again didn't want to go outside the code for something this tall. So they're using concrete shear walls for wind and seismic resistance. This particular building, I, I didn't. our team got to visit it. I wasn't able to make it. but. Apparently, if you're on one floor, you've seen them all. It's all identical. So if you ever go see this building, just you can stop at the second floor, unless you want a good view, I guess. That was kind of their signature final panel that they, they put in after they celebrated for getting that thing down. So with that, if you have any questions for me, I'll hang out, I'll hang out here for a bit, um, and I'll take questions if you have it. If not, thanks for having me, and I always like an excuse to come to UMass, so thank you. <laughs>